Although we live in a state named Indiana, many Hoosiers don't know much about the state's deep Native American heritage. The Miami Nation originated here and still have a significant presence in our state. Join our cross-cultural communication course as we learn about telling the story of the Miami, coming up on In the Studio. Welcome to In the Studio. I'm Justin Reeves. And I'm Ethan Obert. Today, we'll be interviewing Stuart Rayford, who's the author of the book, The Miami of Indians of Indiana, A Persistent People. Rayford has researched and written about the Miami Nation of Indiana, beginning with his doctoral dissertation in 1982. Rayford also assisted the Miami in defending their treaty rights in the 1980s. Welcome to campus, Dr. Rayford. Thank you, it's a privilege to be here with you too. So uh, to start off, can you just tell me a little bit about what originally sparked your interest in the Miami Indians of Indiana yes. and kind of what inspired your research on well, the Miami Indians? That's a great question. Uh, to start out with, I came from a family that had lots of stories uh, and my parents were actually cousins from a German settlement up near Greenfield, Indiana. So I was hearing family stories of migration to the United States and uh, family stories of just about anything as a child and I was a good listener and they were good storytellers. So I got that excitement for about communities and that led on to the Miami Indians later on. That's awesome. Um, how did you approach your research of the Miami Indians and what were some of the challenges you faced when researching other cultures? I approached my research with an open mind. I was not trained as a cultural anthropologist or as a historian really. I just had questions about community. How do communities live on? How do they change? And what are their stories? Um, so we read in your preface that you also did research on um, other urban Indian cultures. Did you face any of the same challenges while researching these other Yes, cultures? I did. I did. Uh, any community is going to be a little defensive because they want to keep their strength and, and they are questioning of outsiders until they feel safe with that outsider. Mm -hmm. So with my background of being a good listener as a kid, I could usually go to a community and let them start talking and settle into things and also respect things that maybe they didn't want to say. Mm -hmm. Since 1982, how has your research of the Miami Nation changed? Oh, it's changed tremendously. I started out, as I'm saying, with really uh, very little background in this kind of work, just a lot of curiosity. And uh, I was led by a, a young Miami man who married one of my cousins. cousins. And uh, I didn't know how strong the community was. So uh, this uh, young man named Mike said, I'll take you up to visit with grandpa, uh, grandma and uh, you can ask her some questions. That's how it got started. <laughs> Um, with all the experience that you've gained over the years, I'm sure you've gained a lot of information and knowledge. What advice would you give to someone who is starting their research on urban Native Americans? I would suggest going to the people, uh, reading up on them uh, as much as you can before you go so you do have a background of knowledge and um, then you can uh, just kind of jump in and I find uh, I can say that people will refer you to other people as you talk. And I'll say, well, I've told you this, but go visit uncle so-and-so. He knows more than I do and be passed around that way. Um, we also noticed in the preface that you mentioned a distinction between the Miami tribe and Miami nation. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about the importance of this distinction? Well, the nation part goes back to treaties. Uh, there are 361 treaties between the United States government and Indian nations. Every single one was broken at one time or another. But the nation part means that the, the uh, government negotiated a treaty with an Indian uh, tribe, and uh, then it was turned into a treaty which was approved by the U.S. Senate. And all those papers are in diplomatic papers at the National Archives right now, the original treaty papers. Thank you so much for sharing your research experiences. We're going to take a short break. Next, some students and other students from our cross-cultural communication course will guide the conversation. They will be discussing how to improve understanding and avoid miscommunication when telling stories across different cultures. Welcome back for our second half of our special episode of In the Studio. I'm Will Slover. And I'm Luciano Salemi. This winter, many faculty, students, and staff participated in a book club 
in which they read Stuart Raffert's book about Miami history and the Miami Indians of Indiana, a persistent people. Thank you so much for joining us again. So how did you gain the trust of Miami tribe to become immersed and learn about their culture? I jumped right in. I had a cousin who married a Miami Indian guy and I was interested in the community. And he said, I'll take you up to visit my grandmother and she can tell you what you need to know. <laughs> so uh, I got to meet an elderly a Miami woman about 80 years old, the youngest of 18 children. Oh. And uh, she knew a lot. And um, I was had to be respectful because I didn't know her. I just listened to what she said. And uh, she said, uh, she told me a few things that were interesting that she said, you really need to talk to my nephew. He knows more than I do. So that got me started with my second Miami Indian and it went on from there for many years. Wow, that's impressive. So in your preface to Miami Indians of Indiana, you mentioned the frontier period of the United States. So how did the stereotypes from this era affect the Miami people? Well, I would say uh, by damaging their lives and making life unsafe for them because uh, they were portrayed as savages or uh, unchristian or dark skinned or whatever you want to say. And uh, so their lives were very difficult and they were attacked various times by the United States government uh, in the American period. I might add though that the Miami are very proud that in 1791, they defeated a US army and killed 630 soldiers and uh, sent George Washington into a lot of anger <laughs> over the <laughs> frontier. Uh, and uh, they're very proud of that. They, uh, they've celebrated the anniversary of that date a number of times because it was a great achievement to yeah. defeat the United States. Yeah. Yeah, but that. other times they were defeated by the United States. Uh, villages were destroyed and men, women, and children were killed. And they remember those things. Oh, of course. That's sad, very sad. So can you tell me about some of the cultural misunderstandings you had about when you went in to meet the Miami tribe for the first time and how quickly you realized what it was really about? Well, it started right away because a second person uh, uh, had two peace medals. These were large, bigger than silver dollar medals that the government uh, awarded Indians for a treaty. And uh, this gentleman who was in his 80s said uh, he jangled these beautiful big coins, uh, peace medals, and he said they aren't worth anything. I knew they're worth thousands of dollars each. What he was saying was that our relations of, of the United States are not worth anything to us. Wow. So there's a message behind the yeah. message. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So we learned that the Miami language is in danger of dying out. Uh, how are the ways like that you, uh, the tribe overcome that, the nation overcame that and how like, how did that happen? Well, that's a great question. I want to say, by the way, I feel so privileged to be at, at this interview at my age. And uh, truly, it's, I think it's important because it's a marker in the uh, history of the Miami nation too, as they come to campus here at Hanover. Uh, what I discovered was, was just to listen to people and to hear their stories and uh, not to interject very much and as I say, to be passed from person to person. And I want to say also, I got to talk to many women as well as men. Uh, there's a, the patriarchy is a different situation. That was a, a mind boggling thing for me, that women were very important. And uh, so there was one stereotype after another that kind of just dissolved or fell away as I did my work. Wow. A little follow up question for you on that. Is there a plan in the Miami tribe to keep their language like, oh, going on and preventing yes. their own extinction? Well, very fortunately, there was a, a man, a Swan Hunter, the woman I first interviewed, her father uh, was equally fluent in Miami and English. And uh, a man from uh, Indianapolis who was very gifted, uh, got uh, thousands of words and expressions down in the early 1900s. Oh, okay. And uh, that has been turned into a book uh, called the uh, Miami uh, language, and it's a very extensive. The language is really well uh, developed as a teaching tool now, and the tribe has teaching resources for young people. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they have camps where the kids are taught Miami language. Nice. That's awesome. So they're still teaching it today. They're still teaching okay. it today. Does mm -hmm. the Indiana's uh, Miami language differ from the Oklahoma's? Or are they Well, they, uh, yes, it does differ, but not very much. Okay. And the Miami language is called Central Algonquian, so it's similar to Chippewa or Ojibwe and uh, Potawatomi and so on. There are a lot of similarities. 
So from my understanding, the Oklahoma tribe was originally located in Indiana, well, then yes. relocated to Kansas and then Oklahoma. So are they the same tribe or are they different tribes well, now? Uh, that's an excellent question. I'll, tr I'll tread a little lightly here. Uh, it came with the uh, removal of the Miami Indians from Indiana in 1846. And because important chiefs were allowed to remain in Indiana, more Indians of Miami's remained in Indiana. So, but at that point in November eight, uh, 1846, the two, they became two separate tribes okay. Okay. and remain so to this day. Although they all know each other and they're related to uh, each other. But they are, uh, uh, federally speaking, they're separate tribes. Okay. So yep. why is Oklahoma the only federally recognized tribe in the U.S.? Oh, well, uh, Oklahoma has, I think, 33 or 35 different Indian nations. Okay. And uh, that's because of removal, even from California, some were brought to Oklahoma. And uh, it has a very high percent uh, for any state of Native Americans. Okay. And, and I believe all of them there are federally recognized. Gotcha. Um, so during the All Nations gatherings, um, have, have you ever been to All Nations Gathering that the Miami tribe in Indiana hosts? Not really. Uh, I, I need to say that I'm not Miami Indian, and in that sense, uh, I don't go to religious ceremonies or anything like that. Uh, I try to, to uh, uh, I keep myself out of their culture in a way. It's not that I'm not familiar with it, but I'm not a Miami Indian. And I always defer to the Miami for uh, what's important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't define them. They define themselves. Yeah. I was just asking because they hold an event every year called the All Nations Gathering yes. in, uh, I think it's Rock City, uh, mm -hmm. Indiana. Mm -hmm. And the, all the attendees, they share music, they share tribal yes. dancing, and then yes. the language. So I was just going to ask, is that one of the ways that they can keep the language oh, alive absolutely. and absolutely. Well? And they own land near there that was, uh, I think, gifted to them. And uh, that's a nice ceremony, and it's it's a it's a wonderful way of extending culture and including other people as well as outsiders. Yes. So, <clears throat> one more question for you. The whole purpose of our class is try to understand different cultures and how to understand when not to cross a line. Do you have any uh -huh. tips on how to go about that and how to learn more without well, going too far? Uh, <laughs> that's a great, <laughs> consuming question. <laughs> I appreciate it. I should say. Uh, there's no, <clears throat> the basic rule is respect, that when you're going eye to eye and you're in a person, uh, contact with a person from a different culture, to let them say who they are and uh, try to not have uh, prejudices or preconceived notions. And it's hard to do because we all carry baggage from our own cultures, mm -hmm. but respect is important. And I wanted to add to that real quickly that I have been in meetings where they were there were just Indians. They were spoke, speaking very unkindly of, quote, white people. And here I am, a white person sitting there, and I realized they weren't talking about me. Mm -hmm. They were talking yeah. about the bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. Generalization. Yep. Well, thank you, Mr. Raffert, uh, for teaching us so much about uh, the All Miami right. culture and sitting here and talking to us today. Good. Yeah, Good. we learned so much. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you so much. It's a privilege. And thank you for joining our discussion today in the studio. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you.